وعلى اله وصحبه وبارك بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على سيد المرسلين محمد الامين اما بعد today inshallah we're continuing on the very important subject which is the foundation of islam as we uh, mentioned last time the four sources of knowledge the quran and the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the qiyas and the ijma of the uh, or the ijma of the ummah and inshallah today we're going to continue on part 2 of the discussion so if you haven't seen the first discussion you can go to the first part of four sources of knowledge um so let's get started and inshallah we'll continue till um you know my three o'clock inshallah and then we'll continue next week after that inshallah. i do think this is a very important subject because if this foundation is not there it's going to be very easy for if 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 the um if this foundation is not there it's very it's going to be very easy for a, a muslim who doesn't know what the foundations are to fall for something that seems like a good argument that goes against the four basic fundamentals of Islam. And so I want the youth and my students and the whole Muslim world for that matter to understand that these are these are four aspects that are basically uncompromisable as in terms of Islamic epistemology and in terms of uh, what is authentic Islam? Where does it come from? What are its foundations? And, uh, you know, these four and the links between these four, meaning how they're interconnected with one another. So, inshallah, let's continue. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa sili amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqa wa qawli. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Um, just a quick recap. We, were, we first talked about the um, hierarchical authority of the four maraja al asaliya of the four sources of knowledge, epistemologically speaking, in Islam, which is Quran, then Hadith, then Qiyas, then Ijma. Then we talked about the historicity and importance of Hadith, because Quran and the Messenger and how the authority of Isnad is established epistemologically, because without Isnad, we don't have this history, this tradition. And when we say tradition, in these videos, we specifically mean the first definition, which is really synonymous with, with the history. So historical record, how does it reach to you? How does it come down to us? Then we talked about the oral tradition of Islam on which both the Quran and the Hadith is based. It has primarily reached to us through the oral tradition of Islam. Then we talked about the collection of Hadith and the problem of authenticity, and I showed you that um, the Hadith were being written down by the Sahaba in the time of the Prophet ﷺ himself. He actually decreed it to be written down. I showed you a Sahih Hadith. Then now we come to the science of classification of on hadith. on that on that uh, brother Muhammad. I want to interject with one aspect that I think is also important for maybe our brothers that are Qur'ani Yun, or if they are brothers, I don't know. But <laughs> I will mention that I was actually... Well, everybody is people. our brother and sister, in, at least in humanity. So yeah, yes, sure, sure. What, right. yes. So um, I was very taken by, back by the number of ayat of Qur'an talking about obey Allah and His Messenger, obey Allah and His Messenger, obey Allah and His Messenger. Yes. You know, it's it's it was just very, you know, if it was only for the time of the Prophet, so many ayahs yes. uh, telling us obey Allah and his messenger, it doesn't uh, make Quran timeless, right? It goes against one of the basic cardinal principles of the Quran itself, that the Quran is timeless. And the Quran is telling us over and over again, obey Allah and his messenger, yes. you know, obey Allah and obey the messenger. Right, specifically. Um, so, and especially our discussion on here there is no mention of Allah, it's just the Rasul. Right, and what this ayah shows is that it's it's salvation, right? Salvation itself is dependent upon 
the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, I don't really know, Sheikh, what else would somebody require to understand this? I really, and, Wallahi Billahi, I don't know. And then, you know, if you take, if you deny part of history, then where are you drawing, drawing the lines? For example, I'll give you an example. Was Mecca a real place? Right? Was Medina a real place? Okay, you accept Mecca as Mecca and Medina as Medina. I would think our Qurani Yun brothers, they do Hajj or they would want to do Hajj. Or they, no, they have this concept no, of Hajj. They don't, they don't no, do Hajj. No. no. So they deny Mecca as a as an as as a place where the Prophet was. They deny primarily the Qurani Yin that I have talked to at least. They deny that um, Haram al Makki is a place of a specific ritual. Oh, that's very interesting because I had another Qur'ani yun from one of the brothers that we had in Turkey arguing with me that, no, we have to do the prayer the way you do it because the Qur'an says, you know, do your qibla towards Mecca, right? And he's like, well, we have to follow the way the people in Mecca are praying because that's what the Qur'an tells us. He's like, I pray the way Qur'an tells us to pray because the Qur'an tells us to face Mecca and to pray like the people in Mecca. So he's like, we do that from generations because that's the way they pray. But uh, then you have the other Qur'ani yuns that are like, no, we're going to only pray three times a day, <laughs> yes. right? So th there's just all sorts of contradictions there. But that, so this I, is exactly yes. the problem. Then what do you do with the word Makkah in Qur'an? What do you do with the word Medina in Qur'an, yes. right? Uh, where, so you deny the entire history that there was ever a historical place where Qur'an came down in time in time and place, that's, you know, eradicating the entire foundation of traditional Islam because traditional Islam is very clear on where it was real. You know, Masjid of the Prophet is the Masjid of the Prophet. Jannat al-Baqi is Jannat al-Baqi, right? Zamzam is Zamzam, right? These are things not only from the time of the Prophet, but continuing from the time of even Prophet Ibrahim, Safa and Marwa. Yes. So once you have historically and geographically dislocated yourself from its original and from what original Islam considers as its original, then you're just grasping for interpretations that have no foundation. It's like, I'm sorry to, you know, sorry to in, keep interjecting, but it's like when Protestants try to reinterpret the Bible different from the Catholics, Right. And then what do you have as a result? You have the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Baptists, you know, the Lutherans. You got like everyone's interpreting the Bible that they want. Right. And so half Christianity is saying, no, you have to get baptized to get salvation. Mm -hmm. The other is like, no, you just need to accept Jesus to get salvation. And because once they lost their catechisms, meaning their aqidah, OK, once they lost their Catholic meaning the, the the codification of history. And they went uh, broke off from the codification of history and started doing their own interpretations. They were in complete disagreement with one another. And so this is what, this is the, the unfortunate future of the Qur'an Yun. And like, in many ways, like our Salafi brothers, they have a situation where they'll, Inevitably, because of the rules within, they're going to disagree and disagree and divide and divide and divide and divide. Yes, yes. And because they don't have a historical foundation. So, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so please continue. Not at all, not at all, Sheikh. Just uh, one addition to this point, like we talked about it. I mean, it is really unfathomable that you would have a complex creation like human beings, and then you will have just a theoretical manual for this this creation you would need to have a practical example that would show you from practical cultural implications how to actually implicate the teachings and decrees found in the quran into your own life it is really unfathomable it's illogical to say and even to consider that there would just be a manual without any practical example. So yeah, you're totally right. I agree, Sheikh, 100%. And then, and then it's like, when the Quran gives a command, pray, right? And the Prophet's praying. Let's say you can make your, up your own theoretical prayer. Forget about valid and invalid. Quran says, pray to the Prophet. The Prophet 
would not a person who believes in the prophet be interested in okay how he prayed like why complete why completely dismiss that in history if the prophet was praying why are you not in the least bit interested in knowing how the prophet prayed why deny the entire corpus of history because one percent of the hadiths you don't like them and it makes you uncomfortable living in the modern times in this <laughs> liberal world so you want to deny 99 percent of the tradition because of one percent of something you're uncomfortable with right yes. because it and then what is the result of what you got the result of what you got is something with no foundations after 1400 years you're trying to guess that's all it is it's a guess it's a yes. guess because you're not looking at the Quran from the perspective of its original viewpoints with scholars that were all inter interconnected with one another. So Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmizi, they all had the same teachers, right? Yes. Im Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, then Imam Shafi is his student. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal is their student. Ahmed bin Hanbal and Bukhari are interrelated. Bukhari and Imam Tirmizi, and Imam Muslim and Abu Dawud are interrelated. I mean, this is just... They're part of the same tradition. Like just even, it's just so fascinating that they're all part of the same tradition. Which religion has that, right? And you're going to, because of words that are making you uncomfortable, you're actually chopping the tree at the epistemological level. I mean, how that's <laughs> yeah. like completely silly. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So, all right, Sheikh, Bismillah. Now, the science of classifications of hadith or usul al-hadith. Um, this is important because when we're going to go to the concrete example, and I'm going to show you, inshallah, by snath and by uh, textual criticism, how it is done. Before going to that, you'll need to understand how the hadith are classified. And somebody who says, oh, but this is not scientific. The moment somebody utters these words, I understand that he has absolutely no background in, 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 uh, in academia. Because if you know how science works, you will understand that this is all scientific methodology. So it is important to know that Islam's history or the oral tradition, as iterated above, is based on the chains of narrations or the isnad. This oral tradition is what we get the Quran and the Hadith through. We do not take each and every incident or saying written in books unless we verify who has said it. The Hadith criticism is even more strict in many aspects than the Isnad criticism applied to the Quranic variant readings. Because in, in uh, the case of the Quran, we also have the written scripture from the time period of, of uh, Uthman, at least. So, you know, there is a bit of leniency when it comes to the Rijal criticism. 3.2. To understand the classification of Hadith, we will first have to understand that it, it has two primary parts. So, Hadith has two primary parts, the isnad part, the chain of narration, and the matan part, the text of the hadith. The matan is further bifurcated into matan and taraf. Taraf is the beginning of the matan, and the rest is matan. Based on these parts of a given hadith, it is classified according <coughs> to the following criteria. 3.3, based on the authority it is referring to as the source, it is classified into either Hadith Qudsi, which is a revelation, but is relayed with the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For example, Kuntu Kanzan Makhfiyan, Fawratu An Orafa, Fakhalatu Nur Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that I was a hidden treasure, then I willed that I be known. So I created the uh, Nur of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then there is the other, the second classification is that of marfu'a, which is a connected narration heard or seen directly from the Prophet ﷺ. So the first classification is when Allah is speaking through the Prophet ﷺ. The second is a connected narration, which is a qawl or a fi'al, a, a doing or a saying of the Prophet ﷺ. That is called a marfu'a hadith. Then there is a maquf hadith, a classification of hadith called marfu'a, which is a narration on the authority of a companion. So a companion says that I heard so and so or I saw so and so uh, done. Right, And then there is Maktu. Maktu is the narration which is on the authority of a successor. So the Sanat, it stops at the level of a Tabi'i. 
So when a Tabi says that I heard the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa say this or I heard him do this, he is primarily drawing upon his uh, experience his his uh, from uh, you know sitting with the with the sahaba but he does not mention a name and then that uh, sanad would become a maqtu sanad because there is no mention of the name of sahabi if, I, if on... you don't mind uh, yes, yes. Uh, can i interject with two points please do please uh, do number one you know the ayah in sama wal basara wal fuad yes how the only way to get knowledge the only way to attain knowledge is either you hear something or, or you, see, you something. see something. Then you can analyze it in your brain or in your mind or in your heart. So that's the only forms of knowledge. Either you observe, you bear witness, or you hear. Right? I think this is very important to clarify because if these are the only two ways we'll know something, right? Other than the things that are very intuitive. For example, one plus one is two. Intuitive knowledge. It's just there, right? Or something based upon your fitra. Other than that, and then other uh, form like wahi would be one. And then there are other like forms of knowledge. But generally, the way man knows in this world of cause and effect something is by bearing witness. You have to, for example, bear witness on the moon, for example. Right? Then somebody can have shahada ala shahada. Somebody saw the moon and then somebody saw the person who saw the moon and he gave him his testimony. I saw the moon. This is the only way. I mean, how do we know about, for example, Plato's Republic? Or how do we know about the writings of Aristotle? Or how do we know the writings of people that wrote 500 years ago? How do we know the Bible is the Bible that's claimed to be the Bible even? right? Or how do we know the Zohar or the Torah or the Talmud these are, it's, it is based upon someone's eyesight, someone's hearing, right? And in, in fact, hearing uh, the sami'at in aqidah, the sami'at in our aqidah is what we believe in whatever the prophet, we hear from the prophet. That is what iman is, is the belief in whatever the prophet told us, we believe it is knowledge that has come to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from the unseen. And it's all samiat. I mean, it's all hearing. The Prophet's telling you about heaven and hell and what, whatever he, everything else he's telling us. That's the first point I wanted to make. That you have to reconcile that how can so many people be hearing and saying and observing and how are you going to deny that, right? That's like someone saying, I saw the moon. And you're like, uh, no, you didn't because it's Sunday and I'm supposed to have a holiday on Sunday. So I'm <laughs> kind of like, I'm uncomfortable, right? The idea is I'm, I'm, com I'm uncomfortable on for you to do this at this time because we live in apparently the modern age. And, and <laughs> the second thing that I want to mention with the hadith, with the sunnah, is that there are tabaqat, right? So it's not like the prophet said it. This is usually... When the people consider it, it's just at this level. But then there are narrations of the next generation. Yes. Confirming the narrations of the first generation. So you have the prophet saying things. Then you have the khulafa saying things. Then you have the sahaba saying things. Then you have the tabi'in, those that knew the companions of the prophet saying things. Things without reference to necessarily the Prophet. Without reference to a Sahab. This, you know, part that you mentioned, Maqdu and Mawquf, this is very important historically because this is what shows that there is a continuity of an epistemology. So, for example, if the Prophet mentioned a punishment of the grave, but then you have a companion mentioning the punishment of the grave without reference to the prophet and then you have a tabari or a taba tabari referencing uh punishment of the grave right which the quran you deny that there's any punishment in the grave well i mean that's silly also because if you believe in the day of judgment it, it's it i don't understand why that interferes but anyway mm -hmm. because it's not mentioned in the quran directly there's one ayah that kind of like indicates it but the point is that you have People hearing, listening, hearing, listening, hearing, listening, 
generation after generation. In fact, Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad, the book, um, I don't know if I can, yeah, uh, I, won't, I won't be able to show it here today, but Tabaqat ibn Sa'ad goes down seven generations of confirming narrations and narrations and narrations. So it's the grandfather of the grandfather. Now that might be hard to imagine for people in today's time where time moves very fast, but you know, events were happening very slow, right? I mean, the amount of change we have in one day now in the stock market in the world and everything, the amount of change we have in one day used to be the amount of change people experienced in like 40, 50 years. So, you know, a grandfather would be talking to his grandson for hours and hours. And then that grandson would grow up and talk to his grandchildren for hours and hours too. So, okay, yeah. Bismillah. Bismillah. Yes, Sheikh, I want to add to this. I think another part of the problem is that uh, at least most of the Quraniyin that I have encountered, and not just online, I'm talking about the real people that I have met, uh, they don't belong to a culture which is rich in these values in this, in this sense. For example, my ancestral graveyard uh, from my father's side, it has around the, the buried uh, generations in that graveyard go back around 67 or 68 generations. We, wow. still, have, we still have people in our village who remember our Shajratun Nasib, Mm. who remember our ancestors, the, the complete chain, wow. the complete chain to, you know, our uh, uh, non-Muslim ancestors, the six. So this is normal for, for example, for me, I think it's also normal for you. It happens, you know, in your qabila, in your, in your, uh, where you belong to. But most of the Qurani, they, that at least I have met, they have a very hard time understanding this because they don't belong to a culture of this sort right so they live in their la la land on the internet yeah yeah that sort of thing you know, it's so an artificial it very, yeah yeah so it is a very concrete thing it's not something that is hearsay or something of that sort when i go to my village when i travel to my village i uh, meet my elders i sit down they still tell me four generations ago so and so been so and so son of so and so said so and so about this or that mm -hmm. so you know that it is part of my culture so yeah i just wanted to add that also sheikh maktu a maktu narration is only maktu if the tabe is mentioning something directly from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because maktu hadith is rejected. We don't accept it. But like you said, if a tabi or a tabi is uh, confirming an al already prevalent uh, tradition and already prevalent hadith, and like you mentioned, the azab of the qabr, the 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 punishment in the in the in the grave, then that's fine. That's not called maktu. That's then. Uh, something that is coming from the tabi or the tabi is considered asar. It's it's considered asar or rivayat. Yes. yes. All right. Based on the isnad criticism, now this was the first classification. The first part of classification was based on the authority the hadith was referring to. The second part of classification is based on the isnad criticism. It is classified into three criteria. First, the links of isnad, whether these are interrupted or uninterrupted second the number uh yeah so according to the links of asnath whether these are interrupted or uninterrupted and according to the number of reporters involved in each stage of asnath and according to the reliability and memory of the reporters these are the three criteria of asnath criticism and according to these then they are further classified into subcategories so first According to the links of Isnat, it is classified into the following six categories. Musnad, a hadith, which has an in uninterrupted chain of narration to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. Right. Mutasal, and so you have, for example, books that are Musnad. Uh, Musnad, Imam, Imam yeah. Ahmad, yes. Right? Yes. So absolutely. these are like companions who heard it directly from the Prophet. And then yes. they're teaching their students, formally teaching their students. And then they're teaching it to their students until uh, it comes to become a book. 
uh, many of these Muslims were actually Sahifas. And then they over time became part of the Musnad. You know, they kind of, yes. a lot of these books, they merged. And anyway, please continue. Yes. Then we have Muttasil Hadith, which is a Hadith that has an unbroken chain of narration, whether it be to the Prophet Wasallam or to a companion or whomsoever it is being narrated from. So we have Muttasil Athar, we have Maktu Athar, so it is then classified that way as well. Then we have a Mursal Hadith, a Hadith with a chain of narration that does not reach the Prophet Wasallam, and mostly not in every single case, but like 95% of the time, ends on a companion, on a sahabi. Then we have a munqata hadith, which is a hadith that has an interrupted chain of narration and ends upon a successor, not even reaching to a companion. Then we have a mu'addal, mu'addal a, a hadith with a broken chain of narration. But this time, in this broken chain of narration, how it is broken? It's not that it's maktu or it reaches a certain level and doesn't go above. No, because there are there is an omission of two or more narrators within this, this chain of narration. So it is totally rejected. Then there is the mu'allaq hadith, which is a hadith without any chain of narration. Hmm. It, now, this is hearsay. The hearsay is the mu'allaq hadith. So this is according to the link of the Isna to the Prophet then according to the number of reporters or narrators in each state of narration a hadith is categorized in the following Mutawatir is a hadith which is reported by such a large number of people that it is illogical to consider that they would agree upon a lie that they right. cannot so for agree. example the people of Medina they're saying it just not in terms of the key people, but because of the key people or via the key people, the whole city is formally and informally saying it. The people of Makkah are saying it, right? The people of uh, Kufa and Basra are saying it. The people of Damascus are saying it. So there's so much consensus. And I think one of the beautiful things that Islam exploded in 30 years in all these different cities actually allowed a space of verification. Because if Islam had not spread, let's say only remained in Medina, for example, then it would be a lot more complicated to figure out what's true, what's not true. But because it spread and you can see, oh, the companions that went there, they taught the same thing. And the companions of the Prophet that went there, they taught the same thing. And the companions of the Prophet that went there, they, they taught the same thing. It allow, allows for a lot more ability to verify, much more easily at least. Yes. Yes. So uh, basically, Sheikh, this is the concept of collaboration, collaborated witness. Yes. Collaborated. Uh, witness. Yes. Very, very good. Mashallah. Yes. That's very good. Yes. Unique. Yes. In, in, in legal terms, when somebody goes in front of a judge or a jury and says, oh, I heard so and so from so and so. For example, Sheikh, let, let's take a concrete example. Let's say uh, you were Zalan Minni. You had uh, some problem with me. You were telling me, or oh, you're speaking without any knowledge, and you hit me. I went to the court, right? And so I said, Oh, Sheikh. You had Omar. to blame me. Okay. Out yeah. Of all the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sheikh, you're my elder. So, you know, I'm just making it up as I go along. Right, right, right. So, yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, so I say, Oh, Sheikh Omar Baloch, Ya Qadi, Ya, oh, Judge, Sheikh Omar Baloch, he hit me. You know, these all these um, things on my skin, these, these abrasions, these are all caused by. Now, this is what? This is just my saying to the judge. What is the judge going to do? Is the judge going to believe me right away? No. It, he is going to ask for witnesses, for, for evidence. So if somebody is presented as a witness in front of the judge and he says, well, I heard Sheikh Umar Blow say once that he was Zalan Ma Muhammad. Mm. Wa Daraba Muhammad. He was very angry with Muhammad, so he went and he, you know, beat him up. The judge is going to then call you and say, did you do so and so? Either you're going to say, yes, I did so and so, or you're going to deny it, right? So that is the concept of collaboration. It's not just hearsay. 
if a witness goes to the judge and says oh i heard so and so say so and so and the judge writes down okay because this guy is saying this so that's it khalas yalla okay it's done no the judge is going to call that person as well and going to make him stand take a stand and say do you corroborate this witness he's saying that he's heard so and so from you did you tell him so and so if that witness is going to say yes i said so and so to him only then the witness is corroborated this is the concept of mutawatir then it becomes a mutawatir shahada then it is linked cuz two three four people are saying the same thing the tawatir is the corroborated witness and it cannot be cannot be cannot be denied no matter it, what you like do it's like denying reality reality no you matter know. what you do no matter how purani you are no matter how much of our tradition you reject you reject it all you reject whatever you want the people who have some knowledge who have a little academic background or scholarly background they understand this so they usually when they reach a certain level in academia they stop saying things like you know we reject all of the tradition because the mutawatir the corroborated witness cannot be rejected ya sheikh Yes, yes. Sheikh, you wanted to say this why orientalists don't even discard hadith because they know that it cannot be i mean they first initially came out with you know very funny ideas that it all had to be a hoax but now alhamdulillah a lot of those orientalists they're like okay this is like serious stuff and it all collaborates one another right and the fact that it's not all one big harmony like it's not exact words they've actually said that actually collaborates to the fact that it's true just like in witnesses if everyone's yes. giving exactly the same story you're going to be like okay what's up what they all like there has to be some you know variation <laughs> exactly you know so yeah anyway bismillah the so the little variations in the text here and there somebody is using one word for the same concept somebody is using another word for the same co- concept and it's not verbatim that actually like you said sheikh that actually cements that this really is corroborated witnessing that the witnesses have not crammed you know the the way liars lawyers uh, liars well i think these two <laughs> words are synonym <laughs> so <laughs> so the way liars prepare a witness right so if a lawyer has prepared all the witnesses the judge would note like that because they would use exact same terms and exact same words so you're very right sheikh there so please make a note of this all you listeners uh and watch uh, watchers there's a difference between hearsay and corroborated witness all right so don't get fooled by the qurani yun when they say oh this is all hearsay right it is important to note here sheikh uh is it time already no 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 we got time we are okay it is important to note here that this is the highest rank that can be assigned to a hadith the highest ranked hadith is the mutawatir hadith then there are ahad these are also referred to as khabar wahid so a khabar wahid is any hadith which does not reach the status of mutawatir that's a khabar wahid then uh, akhbar ahad are further categorized into mashhur a hadith not reaching the status of mutawatir but nevertheless is reported by more than two reporters after mutawatir this is the strongest category of hadith the mashhur hadith then there is aziz hadith uh, at all stages of narration two narrators are at least found so basically there is a little difference of opinion in in the mutawatir hadith as in how many at least how many people should be present in each stage of narration so one hadith would reach the uh, the uh, the category of tawatur there are some muhaddithin that say at least more than 3 like at least 4 or above some of them say at least 5 or above and some of them say at least 7 and above so the least that we have is 3 plus so more than 3 people if they are present in each uh, each stage of narration then that's a mutawatir hadith the aziz hadith is where there are only two narrators uh, are found at each stage of narration then there is the gharib hadith which is, which is just narrated by one reporter in each of the stages of narration 
So these categorizations were uh, based upon the number of reporters found in each of the uh, each of the uh, stage uh, of narration. Then we have the category categories of hadith, the classification of hadith based on validation or invalidation of reliability and memorization of the narrators. Uh, now this is called al jarh wa taadil, jarh invalidation, taadil validation. Uh, Brother Muhammad, let me yes. show you something very interesting. Please do. Sure. So let me just give you an example, okay? Like in the U.S., I don't know if you can see this. It says yes, the federal can. rules of evidence, yes. right? Most of these evidences have to do with eyewitnesses or people who heard something from someone else. This is the small booklet of the U.S., okay, in federal rules of evidences, right? And I, I would go through this maybe at some point in our life because it's very <laughs> interesting Inshallah. looking at the... Um, the rules of the witnesses in the federal courts of the United States of America, and you pick up the big, thick books of whose shahada is accepted and whose shahada is not accepted. Because, for example, just one simple example, okay? When they look at rules of evidence, they do not consider the morality of the person, okay? They do not consider if the person person's living a moral life or if he's living an immoral life. It's, they just only look at what he is witnessing, okay? He witnessed a contract or he was in, you know, sometimes it's even worse than that. Sometimes the witness is actually supposed to be immoral. Like, let me give you an example. There's a gang of six people. You know, in America, most cases are solved by what is called plea bargain. Plea bargain is, for example, there are six people and they all committed a crime. And they go to one of them or a few of them and say, you know, your brothers are going to turn you in. So why don't you become a witness against them? And we will give you less jail time or we will let you out. Exactly. But you have to be a witness against the other five. The Sharia wouldn't accept that. Yeah. Okay? We, wouldn't accept, we wouldn't accept plea bargain, which is how most cases in America get solved. Okay. Now, our rules of evidence are far more complicated, meaning sophisticated in a positive way, far more morally based, right? Spiritually based in some cases, you can even say at the level of Imam Bukhari, what he did with the horse. If you remember, I yes. can mention that if it comes up. But this is the federal rules of evidence here in the US, right? Uh, and and I, I want you to, uh, look at this. Uh, I don't know if you can see this right over here. It says authentication and identification. Do you see that? Yes. Meaning you have to know if the person who's giving the testimony is really the person who is supposed to be giving the testimony. The first thing you have to do is you have to identify and authenticate that this is the person who it was that actually was there according to the other testimonies. So everyone involved, they have to be identified. Everyone involved has to be authenticated that they are, they have been identified. Otherwise, the witnessing process will fail. The second thing that is very interesting is what we call an expert witness. Yes, an, an expert, expert witness, testimony. Yes, an expert testimony. In Islam, what we have is in, in the West, generally, generally, 99.9%, the witness in a case is one group of people. They are identified and authenticated. And the expert witness is somebody else. And he's yes. also identified and authenticated. Okay. But in Islam, the the thiqa, that when we say thiqa, we are saying they are Trust expert word. witnesses. And they have been identified as who they actually are, both in yes. one. Right? So it's, okay. So I just wanted that to be there. No, Sheikh, this is actually extremely important because, and this is the reason, Sheikh, I don't usually indulge into debates of this kind when somebody comes and says, oh, hadith is all hearsay because I, 
totally then get that this person has absolutely no academic background. He doesn't even know the legal system. He doesn't even know what Shahada is. So hearsay and corroborated witness are two different things. And like you talked about the expert witness, like you, Sheikh, you would be an expert witness in a trial in which, for example, a judge asks about the mental condition of a patient, right? So you would appear as an expert witness. You would testify that, okay, I evaluated this person uh, psychologically or according to psychiatry, the psychoanalysis and whatnot, the whole shebang. And this is, these are the traits of his personality or her personality that I, I identify. So now, I want you to enjoy this a little bit. Okay. So part of what they consider the witnesses, right? I don't know if you could see this. What does it say? Can you tell? Hearsay. Uh, yes. Hearsay. Yes. Okay. The same concept. Yes. Yes. Different words, same concept. Hearsay. Same concept. Yes. Can you see it on the screen? Yes, we can. We can. Okay. Yes. Now I want you to look at this. It discusses the difference between opinions and expert witness. Expert witnesses. Now, what that means, I'll tell you what that means. A Qurani Yun would never, if he's if he's consistent. A Qur'ani Yun would never accept the decision of a court case yeah. because they have witnesses in it. A Qur'ani well, Yun... Made me, you made me laugh out so loud. Why would they be consistent? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. You know, if... Then a Qur'ani Yun should also hold that all the cases that have eyewitnesses which is everybody's i everybody is a witness either to themselves or to you know all the court cases should be thrown out yes all the court cases should be thrown out because why because well to them it doesn't matter who saw what or who heard what or who did what and it doesn't matter who is just saying something he heard versus who is an expert who was teaching for 20 years of his life, you know, none of that matters to them. And so, you know, yes, yes. welcome to the yes, land yes. of the fool. <laughs> yes, Sheikh, absolutely. Sheikh, the high point of, I think, today's discussion was if the Qurani youth are consistent. I mean, <laughs> I mean for real, Qurani youth and consistent, that's like, you know, two worlds apart, man. So, <laughs> anyways, Sheikh. Sheikh, should we continue with the hadith now? With, with the, yes, with please. The Let's uh, do maybe Bismillah. a few more minutes. Yes. Okay, yeah. Sheikh. Bismillah. Bismillah. So, based on validation or invalidation of reliability and memorization of the narrators, very important to note, jarh wa ta'deel and memorization. So, one aspect is the uh, moral aspect, whether this uh, narrator has ever lied in his or her life, whether he was a kazab or he was a sadiq, and also how was his memory. Sometimes when the muhaddithin, people like Ibn Ma'in or Khatib Baghdadi, when they say matrukul hadith, that we don't do not take hadith from this person, sometimes they don't mean necessarily that this person is a kazab. Sometimes they are saying that this person, you know, lost his uh, faculty of memory in his uh, certain age, and so he's, he wasn't reliable anymore. So a hadith is categorized as follows according to jarh wa ta'deel. Sahih. So these are the terms that you hear most of the time. And these are these categories are based on ilm ajarh wa ta'deel. Sahih, a sahih hadith is one in which all reporters in the chain of narration are found to be trustworthy, thiqa, and of the best memory possible. Then there is Hassan hadith, in which all reporters in the chains of in the chain of narration are found to be trustworthy, thiqa, but some might not be best of retainers, best of memorizers. So that hadith is called Hassan. Then there is Daif hadith, which does not reach the status of a Hassan hadith. Then there is so a Daif hadith is in which there are uh, narrators, some of them are thiqa, some of them are not thiqa, some of them are not trustworthy. Then and over here, is... I want to mention trustworthiness specifically means trustworthy expert witness. 
Meaning, in in a sense, as 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 meaning, when you say somebody thiqa, he's an expert in his field, right? And uh, okay, Bismillah. And the last category in this classification is maudua. A maudua hadith is a fabrication or forgery established based on any of one of the narrators being a liar, a kazzab. So muhaddithin clearly mention. When they come across a, a narrator of this sort, they clearly say, Kazab, Yadawul Hadith, Kazab, Matrukul Hadith, Kazab. They will always mention the word Kazab. There are very few exceptions to this rule. So that is a Maudu Hadith. That's a fabrication. Finally, and also based... one of the links between Quran and the Hadith, the all the Sayyid Hadith, if you take all the Sayyid Hadith, 99.99% of them are in congruency with the Quran. And none of them disagree with the Quran. Almost, you can say, 99.99%. Okay, so that it is can. a further confirmation of the Quran as well as the Hadith. Both confirm yes. each other. B because it can't, ya Shaykh. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Then how would there be a contradiction? Right? So you're yes. very right there. Finally, based on the nature of matan and isnad, a hadith is categorized in one of the following two. A munkar, when either a hadith text goes against the other established sacrilegious texts like the Quran, the Sahih, or the Mutawatir hadith, etc. Or its narrators are deemed weak and untrustworthy. So this last category uh, takes into account both the matan and the isnad. And then, uh, so these are really, uh, this classification has only two categories, Munkar and Mudraj. The Munkar hadith I already told you guys about. The Mudraj hadith is a hadith laden with interpolation or injected concoction, either in its isnat or in its matan. Mostly in its matan. A Mudraj hadith is classified as a Mudraj hadith because after doing a thorough uh, a textual criticism, matan criticism, you, fi you find out that there has been interpolation into its text. So for better understanding of these classifications, please look at the diagram below. Now I spent a whole day just making this. So I hope this will actually clarify. Wow, Let me God. just, yeah. So there you have in front of you the classification of, of hadith. First of all, the three main classifications are according to authority, according to isnad, and according to matan, but also isnad, but primarily according to matan. So according to authority, there is the hadith qudsi, there is the marfu hadith, the maquf hadith, and the maqtu hadith. Then according to the isnad, there are, these are further classified into three subcategories. According to the links, uh, the the chains of narration linked to which qarn. It is either a musnad hadith, a muttasil hadith, a mursal hadith, a munqata hadith, a mu'addal hadith, or a mu'allaq hadith. Then according to the numbers in each of the stages, it is either a mutawatir hadith, a khabr wahid, and then khabr wahid is further classified into three subcategories, a mashhur, a aziz, an aziz, or a gharib. Then the reliability of the narrators, Sahih Hadith, Hassan, Daif, Maudur. Then finally, based on primarily on Matan criticism, we have a Munkar Hadith or a Mudraj Hadith. So these are the classic. Now, mostly what people are confused about is this thing. So once it is clarified in their minds, I don't think then, you know, any other questions would remain. So one Hadith can be a combination of these classifications. So, for example, we hear many times that the uh, that a hadith is Hassan Gharib. So, what does it mean? It means that according to the classification <coughs> of, of reliability of the narrators, it is a Hassan hadith in which all the narrators are siqah, all the narrators are trustworthy, but there might be one or two narrators whose memory is not very good. So it is classified as a had Hassan hadith. But at the same time, it is a gharib hadith because in each of the stages of the narration, there is only one rabi, there is only one narrator. So it is called a Hassan gharib. 
So that is how the classification of the um, hadith, uh, the scientific branch of knowledge of ilm, usul al-hadith, works. Now, Sheikh, you ordered me to, you, you told me to uh, present our viewers with some of the books of Al-Jarh wa Ta'adil and Asma al-Rajal. So these are so, some of... Inshallah, we can maybe do number four next time, next week. Absolutely. That's okay. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But I do want to mention that I think the, even in the West, the oldest case, uh, what we call a cold case, that was solved. Yes. A cold case means it's very old. Yes. And uh, it was a kidnapping, I think, that happened in the 19, in 1917. Uh, it was a kidnapping that happened in 1917 or uh, in 1957, sorry. And then it got solved in 2013. Okay. And you for that, you need witnesses and all different types of evidences and so on and so forth. So that's almost a 70-year case. That was, meaning it, it, it's the same idea, right? The same principles, because knowledge is either coming through seeing or through hearing or some other uh, factual evidence, a written evidence. And over here, I wanted to mention about that is that, you know, something that is, it says here, and again, in the, in the federal rules of evidence, contents of writing, recordings, and photographs. They're each defined, what is a photograph, what is a writing, what is... We also, from the very beginning, had written tech, written documentations. Like Ali radiallahu anh had ahadiths from which he did his whole, uh, uh, you know, the, the laws of inheritance and taxes and so on and so yes. forth. You know, amongst... Ali, yes. Sahifa to Ali ibn Abi Talib, yes. And so, uh, and then... Uh, in addition to that, I wanted to share maybe one more thing, uh, which is... Uh, I'm sorry, Sheikh, can I interject with one point yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Bismillah. The Masahif, Masahif al-Sahaba, on which Abi Bakr radiallahu anhu's collection of the Quran was based, and later Uthman radiallahu anhu's collection of the Quran was based, these Masahif al-Sahaba had a hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam written on them. So this is a proof, a concrete proof, just to further uh, what you were just saying, that the hadith were being written at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. It isn't like somebody started doing this 300 years Remember after. Remember the scholar time. in Pakistan, Ghulam Murtaza Malik, who got killed? Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes, uh, Ghulam yes, Murtaza yes. Malik... Uh, wrote an article in which he documented, I think, more than 50 sahifas. MashaAllah. Masha he, he documented. And uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to also bring this uh, last point, inshallah, before we... This will be a good transition to the next lecture or the next series that we have on this. It's called Public Record. Okay? Yes. Public Record is something that's a record in public, meaning the public knew about it. These narrators that we're saying or we're talking about, like let's say Ata or Al-Kamash or Mujahid or any of these narrators, they were not, uh, you know, like somebody sitting in a masjid and we don't even know his name, right? <laughs> and we, we don't know how to like verify and there's no like, you know, how to, because these were, these were people part of the public record. Anything they said, became part of the public record, right? Yes. And um and and because why? Because they had students and whatever they said became part of the public record throughout the whole city. Everyone say he said this. Well no he says this. And this would be persons because they were public figures and what they said became public record. And they themselves were public record that the whole city knew this person existed. And there's enough documentation to prove that for each of these narrators. So I think that's important to also know because, you know, um, nowadays, if I'm called to court today, okay, uh, if I'm called to court, they have a record of me in public, right? And then I go to court, but I'm not well known in the, in the city. This is not the case of these people. These people, uh, it's not like 
me and you had a disagreement in some matter and then we're called to court and we're like, you know, nobody knows us. These were people who had a high public standing. Everything that they said became part of the public record. It affected the court proceedings of their times based upon what they said, right? So, you know, if Imam Malik said, well, you know, well, this is my opinion, that affected how the courts were going to run and how they were going to make judgments. Absolutely. So things can, that's a whole field that I don't think we've touched enough on is how the Qadis were making judgments in each generation. Uh, we have some very interesting Ottoman records you know, on this issue. We have some interesting records in the uh, in the in in Spain, Muslim Spain. But what you do see from the records that we do have again is consistency. You find consistency. You know, Spain was Maliki, so obviously they were making rulings based upon the 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 fatwa of Imam Malik. But it's consistent. And so, yeah, I just wanted to end with that, is that the Hadith literature and its expert witnesses and how it affected the courts and how it affected uh, general scholarship and the standing of these people as public records uh, and expert testimony. I mean, to deny that is just, it's sheer stupidity. Collaborated witness cannot be denied. It's it's a, it's a primary... Uh... You know, it's 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 a primary brick in the structure of even the legal system. So how would you go about denying it? This is actually, Sheikh, very important that you're saying. And if we look at the hadith of Sabat Ahruf, what happens there? Omar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he listens to, he, he just hears Hisham bin Hakim radiallahu anhu reciting Surah Furqat. Mm. So does, does he say, okay, fine, because he's a Sahabi, he's reciting the Quran this way, okay, then fine, he must have heard it from the Prophet Wasallam. No, he takes him and brings him to the Prophet Wasallam. Oh, Prophet Wasallam, I've heard him pronounce certain words in Surah Furqan different to what you have taught me. Mm. So this is the whole concept that Ilmul Hadith is based upon. And you are extremely right. We should sometimes take up this. Actually, Sheikh, Jazakallahu Ahsan al Jaza, I'll tell you something very honestly. Wallahi uqsum billah, I would have never spoken on this subject because, like you said, it's so ridiculous for somebody to say, oh, hadith is hearsay. Oh, we reject hadith because there is some uh, counterfeit hadith. It is so ridiculous that I would consider personally a waste of time to indulge into this. You know, if, if you know what I mean, like you just yeah, said absolutely. a couple of minutes ago, that this is sheer stupidity. Yeah, yeah. How would somebody reject mutawat, at least mutawatir hadith, which is public record, which is corroborated evidence? How would you go about rejecting it? So, jazakallah, sanjizarish. Okay, inshallah. Yeah, I'm worried about the coming generation and their, because we'll discuss this one day, but you know, th this liberal Islam is taking hold and traditional Islam is taking a backseat. This, like in Pakistan, it comes in the form of Ramadi Islam, right? Um, so you have this very ritualistic Islam and you have this very liberal Islam and you have in the middle somewhere squeezed in there some authentic version of Islam. Um, and even that has, you know, different. But we're going through very term, term difficult times. Uh, and and so it needs to be clarified. What is our tradition? And for those people that are listening today, they might be trapped 10 years from now. So, But if they have this foundation, then it, at least something will stick in their mind and say, no, 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 you know. Uh, and generally, wallahi, wallahi, anything that I've ever found is a problem, and maybe you can speak to this, that if you actually go do the research, you will find either other alternative opinions or something within the tradition that will um, that will make sense. You Absolutely. Know. Absolutely. The difference of opinion that we find in our tradition is actually a beautiful thing because without that, there will be an intellectual dearth. You know, if you know what I mean. 
how do you grow intellectually how do you grow academically you grow by dif difference of opinion by the law of difference of opinion the 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 academia itself is found is founded on this very law so it is and a very on that thing. i want to mention of all of the islamic traditions meaning of the four mazahibs at least and you can even say five and six okay <clears throat> we have an agreement of according to one of the scholars when he looked at all the asuli issues and the four, meaning the the major issues and the minor issues he looked at both of them he said we have an agreement on 73% give and take, which is a high percentage compared to it's any other. Very high, very and high. And if you look at the traditional Islam from its major asuli things, like we know that there's salah, we know that there's five times salah, we know that it, there's takbir, there's qiyam, there's ruku, there's sujood, there's salam, all the different parts of prayers, for example, all the major issues, okay? If you look at all the major issues, there's an agreement of more than 99%, like in terms of uh, Maturidi and Ashari, in terms of the, the essentials of the fiqh, right? In terms of these four principles we're talking about, this is not somebody, anybody, 99% of Muslims' Islamic scholarship wouldn't deny. Absolutely. And so uh, what's also interesting, uh, I, I'll just, I'll let you have the last word, but I'm going to mention this. In the beginning, there were no schools of thought. Right. And as time went by, if you look at, in fact, a non-Muslim did this academic paper on this. He looked at where, what school of thought did different schools, uh, different scholars, what schools of thought did they belong, belong to as time went by. Right. So in the beginning, it was like we're following this companion or we're following this tabari or we're following, you know, Atta, or we're following such and such scholar. Right. And then it became the four schools because they merged. And you find the scholars going and you see Islamic scholarship having a consensus and building a consensus. In the beginning, it was more than four mazhabs. I think there were like 13, 14 big hitters, meaning big people. And then some of the mazhabs, they merged. Some died out for various reasons. But like Lais could have been a mazhab in himself. Qadi Abu Yusuf could have been a mazhab in himself. He said it himself, in fact. So uh, 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 Sufyan Authority became Hanafi, yes. you know, uh, mazhab. So some of them merged. But this huge consensus of Islamic scholarship, these were not stupid people. They knew how to collaborate witnesses. They knew how to verify linguistics and language and how to, uh, you know, um, yeah, so it's just to be dismissive of, dismissive of this is, like I said, utter sheer stupidity. You're very right, Sheikh. I was saying that, uh, you know, differences of opinion are actually what makes you intellectually stronger and you, you progress intellectually in a given academic field. Also, something that you mentioned is very important. Basically, the problem of our youth, the youth of today is, at least according to me, what I've seen, one of the major problems is that with the advancement of technology, they somehow think that they are, they will have the last say, you know, because just because they have a 4K resolution ready laptop, a gaming laptop, a high-end gaming laptop, just because they have internet connections, just because they have Windows 11 and these apps on their Android or iOS driven uh, cell phones, they somehow think that our parents, our ancestors, people gone by, they knew nothing, absolutely nothing. I mean, like saying, like I was talking to these students the other day, they were like, sir, come on. You think my grandfather knows about things that we know about today? I mean, through internet and whatnot. And I was like, you know, this is. I mean, one uh, of I'll give you one example that how technology has handicapped us now. Uh, you can hardly have a student doing anything without calculators. And you've asked Absolutely. them about the original theorems of math. Prove to me one plus one is two in a theorem. But prove to me, you know, uh, that these this uh, this is, you know, that is that is that four uh, like a square with its angles will make 364, 490 degrees will make 360. Prove it to me in a theorem. People don't know their the original from where things began. 
They don't know the... Sorry, Sheikh. Basically, they say that this is all redundant because now we have internet, so information is there. We don't need to memorize or work it out this way. We can just have Wolfram Alpha on our cell phones and we can look up all the solutions there. That's their argument. Yeah, again, the problem is, especially when it comes to Islam, by the way, and I want to do a video just to show this, that when you Google Islamic things, you a lot of times... That I've noticed when I would, you know, when I use Sheikh Google for myself, okay, <laughs> I will see, you don't get the answers of Quduri or Asuli, you know, uh, the, the, you don't, you don't find traditional Islam, right? You find the untraditional Islam. Yes. So that's like, uh, that's the problem. Hopefully, yeah. Sheikh, I can become a part of that video of yours. I'd be very interested. Yeah. I mean, we just uh, think of like a hundred random questions and ask the internet. Right? Yes. Okay, inshallah. All right. Inshallah. Should we continue Alex. next? Inshallah, Sinam 1. Next week will be very interesting. Very, you know, it'll be very interesting. Yes. Okay, Sinam 1.